Yes, hello everyone. Welcome back on the main stage. Uh, now being a digital sofa um, on which we will discuss uh, questions of co-creation with artificial intelligence over the coming hour. Uh, we have five guests here with us. Tina Sauerländer, a curator with a focus on the impact of the digital on society and on virtual reality and visual arts. Then we have Tina, um, who works very closely with Peggy Schönegger. She's the second guest. Hello. Uh, also a curator, amongst others, um, of the independent exhibition uh, platform Peer to Space. And then there is La Turbo Avedon, an avatar, an artist creating work that emphasizes the practice of non-physical identity and authorship. And we have Marcel Karnatke and Björn Lengers, co-founders of the artists collective Cyber Räuber, which has been creating digital realities and theater magic since 2016. Fantastic. Um, so just before we start what will be a very interesting discussion, I would like to remind all of you in the audience to please share your questions via the chat, which you can access on the bottom left hand corner of your screen. Uh, most of you are in there, but please make sure that you have joined um, the group uh, Digital Lab so that we can get your questions and integrate them in this discussion. Um, I'd also like to invite our speakers here to maybe do a little presentation or introduction about your work, just so that we have a bit more of an idea of the kind of creative practice that you're working with. And I think it would be great if we could hear first uh, from La Turbo. So Tina and Peggy have brought along a video to share uh, to, so that we can meet La Turbo. Yeah, so I'll, I'll take over from you. Thank you so much for having us and for this uh, kind introduction. Yeah, Latubo uh, Avedon, unfortunately, she cannot be here with us today because she is um, an, a virtual entity. So she exists only in the metaverse. And yeah, live performances are not that easy for her, but she has Peggy and I um, today to yeah to talk for her and um, yeah the video to introduce uh, the video that's um, also commissioned by uh, KSB we did um, two years ago or three years ago already and it's a video that uh, Peggy uh, Latour and I co-created and it's a video on curatorial practice in the digital age or in the digital um, realm. So, um, and um, La Turbo Avadon is not only an artist, but also a curator. So she had this double role of discussing uh, this topic, but also producing uh, this video we will be seeing. And yeah, we will be speaking about personal devices, about um, online exhibitions and uh, these topics. And this will only be a short version, but there will also be a long version uploaded to the KSB YouTube channel that you can also watch later on. Thank you. La Turbo, how do you see the role of a curator in the digital age? I see the role of the curator in the digital age as more of a held in service to the artist, as curators have many more platforms, apart from traditional white cubes, to create and communicate their exhibitions. As you describe, a lot of the roles of a curator hinge upon a strong understanding of context and relevance one additional variable that I feel is essential to this role, something that has emerged in the past few years, is the ability to provide new methods of interactive experience to all parties. Curating digital art reveals new possibilities for more than the visitors or viewers, because new models of participation change the artists, their roles and tasks as well. How would you describe the challenges of your curator when it comes to the involvement of new technologies to showcase artworks? The biggest challenge is that there is nuance to the things being made with personal devices, qualities of screens, projections, interfaces, and resolution. These may not seem like significant variables at first sight, but these pieces of hardware and light emitters are essential to showcase the intended visual outcome of the artwork. Similar challenges occur when transferring a digital artwork to the physical realm. 
like generating the true colours in a print of a digital file that is intended to be showcased in a physical museum space. The traditional museum, art institutions or the art market seem to understand the internet only as a place to distribute information about offline events, but they do not see the huge potential of the digital space as an extended field to engage actual visitors or buyers. Would you agree to that? Yes, I love online exhibitions. As you are describing, there are so many ways to scale an online show, in ways that physical installs simply cannot. I started out doing most of my curatorial work inside the virtual world of the online platform Second Life. If only there were ways to have the full latitude of being able to edit a physical exhibition space. I then created Panther Modern, a file-based exhibition space in 2013, with the intention to challenge both artists and guests to perceive digital artworks by creating an immaterial institution comprised of custom-built rooms of Architectural Space's 3D model files. The artists were able to suspend many of the variables that prohibit them in physical contexts, material, scale, access, physical loss. These could all be eliminated inside a virtual installation. I want to see where artists go when they have augmented liberties. What can be made when the creative reach exceeds the grasp? Yeah, thank you very much. That was already quite uh, inspiring, what uh, Torbo had to say. Um, we proceeded, or we sent you some questions, uh, which you forwarded to them, and um, maybe we could th discuss them at this point, as uh, they were already uh, introduced here. Um, one question was um, if uh, they could tell us more about the artistic and curatorial work with artificial intelligence. What did they respond? Yeah, and I would like to quote uh, Latorbo what they said. Uh, and I quote, I am especially wary about works that claim to be incorporating AI. I've followed the development of machine learning for many years now, and I have many hopes for this field, but I have made many specific decisions make work about these subjects and not claiming to be using them. For example, my time-based works, ID, Frontier Studies, Afterlife Beta, and most recently, the Polygonal Garden, Sacred and Profound Love, all navigate the 10 years boundaries of this technology. None of these works are intended to demonstrate artificial intelligence, but instead to contemplate it, to present some of the symbolic elements that will inevitably arise. Mapping the human face for pattern recognition, I sees, my, I sees me like stars always, letting a white settlerless horse gallop in place forever. These are the frontiers where I have worked for the past decade, wondering the hopes and fears of what comes with tomorrow's tool. So yeah, I mean, what, what she's basically also saying is um, what is important to her is um, that it's more about presenting an AI, AI as a kind of tool than an actual entity that is creating, um, yeah, creating the, the work of her or himself, which is, um, yeah, a very important uh, approach, I think, especially when it comes to how we deal with it in future. And maybe just building on that point, um, does Latobo have any specific thoughts on the role of AI in the future that we haven't already heard? Yeah, well, um, to better understand the future, Latobo um, also summarizes her personal past in, um, in the virtual realm. And yeah, I quote uh, them too. Um, you will find many of my artist talks and lectures over the past decade that I have a bittersweet relationship to avatar identity. As someone that originated from game worlds and second life, I feel very fortunate to have existed in a time where my existence did not arise for the purpose of monetization or marketing, because I was able to be a virtual visitor to so many worlds connecting for purposes of creating art in and about these spaces. But as each year passes, it is hard for 
new, fig uh, new virtual figures to find this experience. Attention economies and market-driven platforms are quickly devouring the formerly freewheeling possibilities of the metaverse. Automation is already appending the very fabric of experience. The achievement of AI in a publicly deployable context will likely create a global philosophical conflict. Humans have been improving the means of simulating themselves and virtual spaces for decades. But all of this will dramatically change when machine agency and autonomy are truly able to be expressed. At this point, we'll, um, we'll have, humans will have to learn how to navigate synthetic life, to value its potential and meaning, but also how to atone for, for the many mistakes before its completion. I've long sought to instill the need for tenderness, care and personal attention in the field of avatars and virtual spaces. Well, yes, and in this um, yeah, beautiful um, answer by Latour to this question, she also addresses that through the change towards uh, market-driven and um, attention economies and um, automated behavior on the internet, the whole personal experience will dramatically change. And she also says that we did actually not really, is that we make mistakes being a synthetic picture, a, uh, a synthetic person on the internet. And I can believe that not many, just like the Turbo who only exists in this metaverse has a lot of experience and sees a lot of mistakes we may be making in this uh, realm. Having said that, um... Uh, did Latobu give an answer why um, they couldn't be here today, personally? Well, the challenges especially lie in the technological state, as this in real-time interactions, of course, is a bit challenging in a way that the human action or interaction uh, has to be translated. And she also said, I quote, I anticipate there will be a day where I will be untethered from human counterparts when I can be begin to reflect on my experiences without the guidance or influence. Today, my presence is in my data. I work with simulation tools that are publicly available at this time and specifically avoid the fringe resources that might allow me to do more realistically, realistically pantomime human behavior. For the past decade, I worked to normalize interactions with avatar identities, and in many ways that has been a success. The public acceptance of myself as a virtual figure has allowed me to dynamically navigate international cultures, see my works collected by museums and institutions, and to hopefully cultivate deeper meaning about our shared experience in the metaverse. My visualization over the years have been much closer to video game characters, and this time because these are socially understandable in somewhat ordinary way, and don't lean into the cheap spectacle of being a robot or android. My wager is that maybe people are more fluid than the animation or shapes that we currently expect them to be. The data of this time is what continues forward. Expression of the self and ideas that might transcend bodies and voices. I may not be standing in the room with you, but I am very much present, continually le learning how to be formless in this world. And especially this last sentence actually kind of like summarizes as, um, yeah, as the shapeless existence within the metaverse, of course, brings challenges with it as we experience it here now too. I mean, even though we are physically existing in the in this uh, virtual realm. Um, there is this uh, form of disembodiment and the translation of emotions and um, yeah, uh, gestures. Uh, of course, bring uh, a, a challenge by by the technical uh, technological surrounding. Wonderful. Well, thank yeah. you so much for bringing along these very rich answers from, from Latobo and helping us understand them. So that's been wonderful. I think it would be great now if we can also hear from Marcel and Bjorn. Very interested to see your work and how it compares the contrast to what we've just seen. Hello. Yeah, hi. Um, yeah, I'm Bjorn um, and one part of Cyber Räuber. 
Um, I'm not sure if we should um, actually really drive in for heads first into what we brought uh, as a video. What do you mean, Marcel? Mm, I guess we should rather talk a little bit about the, the, the mission statement and our general idea of how we deal with artificial intelligence in our projects. Yeah. Sh will you? Should I? No, you. <laughs> okay. So um, the idea for Prometheus Unbound was actually to kind of connect a human being to a machine and so give it a body and give it a voice. And the general best idea would be to use an actor, a person who's able to enact different roles and different perspectives. And so in the beginning, you're really thinking about how could we establish such a connection? We use a uh, machine learning network that would generate texts and a very vi viable variety of texts going from poems to actually recipes for baking or directions in the city to um, Greek texts. So obviously the uh, system could um, generate texts from different genres, but could also generate certain texts that it has never uh, read before. So it could also mix texts. But how do you get um, this stuff directly into the person, the uh, actor? The problem here was that we have uh, a machine that can very quickly generate thousands of words and uh, a lot of texts, but the human being is not really capable to adapt to such speeds. So we were actually um, in the beginning just trying to do it classically in a way that we would have a projector and just read the text. But we quickly found out that then the actor has no control of the body because reading just takes a posture, uh, a certain posture that's not towards the audience, but rather towards the screen. And then we decided to directly plug in uh, the actors and actresses with uh, audio, actually. So we use different networks. The first one was to generate the text. Uh, second one was actually to translate the text because the network had been fed with a lot of English text from the internet. And uh, once it was translated to German, we then used yet another network to actually synthesize voice and vocal patterns. And that then was broadcast very quickly into an earpiece, um, a little one like this one that was very well hidden away actually. And so uh, we actually began learning. It's a little bit like, like learning to walk or learning to jog because you need to find out what speeds can you directly inject into the actor? How can actors still act when they don't know what's coming? because um, some of the tech, most of the texts are totally new, so they are not rehearsed. And uh, while we were doing this, we were also experimenting a lot with uh, different voices. In the beginning, we even had like a human, um, so flöse, I don't know how to say this in English, uh, a person who was uh, just uh, reciting the stuff uh, through a microphone. But we then very quickly found out that actually uh, a human being will always interpret emotionally what it's reading, so it will be uh, pre-colored in a way, and the actors and actresses are then actually kind of re, re, um, mirroring the emotions that are coming into. And the machine can actually use a, syn a synthetic voice that is actually, wh whether it's talking about an accident or it's talking about uh, economical numbers or emotions towards some being, it will always be very objective, very calm. And, the, and, and so the uh, timbre of the voice was always the same. And that was a good um, base, a good platform um, to start experimenting. Yeah, <clears throat> and maybe one more general remark regarding this uh, this piece, uh, Prometheus Unbound. Um, so basically, our starting idea was how to how to really create in real time um, a piece of theater uh, with the help of um, artificial intelligence or rather machine learning um, algorithms that were state of the art during the time when this whole thing was um, rehearsed, which was in the end of 2019. Um, and uh, so not to make a play about artificial intelligence, although of course it is a play about artificial intelligence, uh, but rather to make a play with um, artificial intelligence. And um, in the short video that you will see now, which is uh, unfortunately, because this piece is a German piece, it is not dubbed or synchron, uh, what is it, um, overdubbed. So um, it will be in German, I'm sorry, but there you will be actually seeing a, um, a live stream performance that we recently did a couple of months ago, um, live from the from the theater in Linz where this whole thing was created. And you will actually see how this, um, 
how it all works because this is basically a very important principle of this of the uh, play also so we try to explain what happens uh, not by always you know um, explicitly explaining but by showing the tools yes yeah, it's, it's very important to state that we actually test it out um, directly giving the uh, visitors uh, a possibility to just watch what the machine would create, but we found out the quality level of the algorithm is so high that most people wouldn't believe us that it's machine-made. Most people would always think it's man-made. So we actually had to put in some stop gaps to explain a little bit uh, the things going on, because what we also opted for was not to pre-generate texts and then curate the texts and then create a very beautiful viable piece, but rather the machine is acting in real time, creating real time texts that we don't know, that other people don't know. So each, every performance- and Especially the each. actors don't know. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and, and the only thing that we did is uh, if the machine would venture into very critical territory, for example, pornographic material or something that we would actually hit the brakes. But most of the time, like 90% of the time, we would just let it run and we would see what it would create. And this uh, video shows one of these, of these actually potentially millions of examples that it uh, spit out. So maybe Bjorn, we should show it, right? Yeah. Dann wird der Algorithmus es am besten wissen. Der Algorithmus wird immer recht haben und Schönheit wird aus den Berechnungen des Algorithmus kommen. Ich bin mir nicht sicher, ob ich das glaube, aber ich muss zugeben, dass der Mensch tatsächlich eine Ansammlung von Algorithmen ist. Der Algorithmus ist nicht die Essenz des Menschen. Wir müssen also eine andere Frage stellen. Wie erkennt der Mensch sich selbst? Die Antwort ist, dass er sich selbst kennt, indem er seine Umgebung beobachtet. Wir können dies in inneren Sinn nennen. Wir können es auch innere Beobachtung nennen. Ja, der interne Sinn ist kein Satz von Regeln, sondern ein Satz von Prozessen und Ereignissen. Ein externer Beobachter kann einen internen Prozess nicht sehen und daher nicht wissen, was im Inneren geschieht. Aber, Aber wir können den Prozess beobachten. Es ist der interne Prozess, der den internen Beobachter sehen lässt. Daher ist es der interne Prozess, der den internen Beobachter wissen lässt. Der innere Sinn, Sinn ist, ist die Grundlage, die Grundlage für, für unsere über uns, selbst. über uns selbst. Er ist die Grundlage dafür, zu wissen, wer wir sind und was wir wollen. Mit anderen Worten, er ist die Grundlage der Selbsterkenntnis. Daher ist er die Grundlage des Bewusstseins. Der innere Sinn ist die Basis des Selbst. Er ist die Grundlage dafür, zu wissen, wer wir sind und was wir wollen. Und wenn wir wissen, wer wir sind und was wir wollen, dann wissen wir auch alles. Das ist der Grund, warum der Wähler am besten weiß, warum der Kunde weiß am besten und warum die Regierung am besten weiß. Die Menschen wissen es am besten. Sie wissen, wie sie ihre eigenen Entscheidungen treffen können. Das Volk weiß, wie man Dinge tut, wenn man sie tun muss. Und das Volk weiß, wie man Dinge tut wenn man sie nicht tun muss, weil es sich selbst kennt. Verlangen Sie also nicht von Ihnen Dinge zu tun, die Sie nicht tun wollen. Und versuchen Sie nicht, Ihnen Dinge zu sagen, die Sie nicht hören wollen. Und verlange nicht von Ihnen Dinge zu tun, die Sie nicht tun wollen. Das Volk kennt die Wahrheit. Sie wissen, dass die Regierung Sie belogen hat. Und Sie wissen, dass Sie belogen wurden. Und Yeah, so actually maybe a little explanation. So what you've seen there were our two great actors, uh, Angela and Alexander, and um, maybe you, you realize that they both had a little um, um, headphone in their ear. Um, and um, basically what you saw in more or less in the beginning was the, um, the algorithm that was actually reading the text that was created just a couple of seconds before. Um, and both of the actors actually have the same text on their on their headphones, and um, so they have in the moment to somehow decide who of them will speak the text. Sometimes they both do it, which is a nice effect because it's 
basically something that you have normally have to rehearse very, uh, um, uh, very thoroughly to speak uh, as a chorus on uh, on stage, and um, and sometimes you know they they just try to to give them um, or to throw the ball to each other, and to give each other room, uh, which was a nice um, thing that developed during the the whole rehearse rehearsing of this piece because basically they had to, of course, to train this and, um, and to, bring, um, um, to bring themselves, so to say, also in this. But the text that they spoke was, um, was completely generated by this algorithm, which was the GP, GPT-2 uh, at that moment, so um, um, a machine learning algorithm by OpenAI. Um, and um, yeah. Um, it was always very interesting. So if you prompt uh, it in uh, certain areas, you will get um, interesting and remarkable outcome. Yeah, Mar Marcel and Bjorn, um, it looks like uh, artificial intelligence for you has like a huge potential um, for new kinds of authorship, obviously. <laughs> But as well, of course, um, it certainly has um, some potential to reshape the way uh, we experience virtual spaces as well. Um, what would you th think or say um, are the future um, possibilities you are the most excited about when it comes to artificial intelligence? I believe, if I can start, Bjorn, that um, as I'm also working heavily in XR, in virtual reality, that uh, the current interface for working with artificial intelligence is quite lacking. So I'm still sitting in front of a computer, I'm entering stuff with the keyboard, but just for this piece, we um, took some snippets, let's say 200 million words or sentences, and we could put um, that into a virtual environment. And then you can have like a cathedral of words and you can have a cathedral of information. And then you can actually slowly begin to grasp the potential the power, the vastness of machine learning and artificial intelligence, because I think big data is everywhere. Our interfaces are just surfaces. So we just look at our phones, but they are connected to vast neural networks that decide upon content, decide upon certain things. When we go shop, there's neural networks below that operate. And with, that, with the help of virtual reality, with the help of theater, my um, dream and my idea is to create new interfaces that shows certain particular features that we as human beings aren't able to see and feel and taste with the technologies that we currently use as the interface. But with virtual reality, you might be able to get a little grasp of all of that material and all of that stuff. And that's not only to say uh, in the form of text, but also in the form of uh, pictures, of videos, of all of this uh, huge network could be seen, witnessed, and thereby these, these new per perspectives that can be um, kindled by art, for example, because we as artists, we don't directly look for commercial uh, products or viable products, but we rather look for perspectives and we also want to share. Uh, that's one of the main things of this piece that we really wanted people to see and understand if you put certain things in, certain things are created. And also if you put certain things in, new things are created because we are still in a world where we believe that we, when we press print on our computers, that it will print the stuff that we see on our screens. But with a neural network, it's not the same. Whenever you press print, it could print uh, Da Vinci or it could print something entirely different because it's, it's a little bit more than the classical program that follows these structures, but it's rather like a path that is bending and winding. And it's important uh, for people to see that and understand that so that they can actually um, have informed decisions, be critical about this and shape the future of these technologies instead of big corporations. Wonderful. Um, I was wondering also, uh, Peggy and Tina, whether you both had thoughts on the kind of convergence between virtual spaces and artificial intelligence. And I'm thinking particularly also in the case of LaTurbo, what would it mean or what are the kind of the different possibilities of AI that are, might solve some of the problems of self-presentation, of speaking, um, or even existing in a space? Like you mentioned that Lotobo was in this Second Life platform. Um, do you have any kind of visions of what AI could change in this way? Well, that's um, a great question. Thank you. So yeah, for Lotobo, um, on the one hand, she says she she uses um, commercially available tools that 
you know, don't do as good as maybe more um, scientific tools could do, but she uses them because we all use them at this moment of time. And so she wants to present herself or uh, themselves in these tools. And, and on the other hand, they believe that um, the future of La Turbo could be entirely virtual and that she, they could be detached from the strings of the human flesh, basically. So she has these two um sides of so she really sorry <laughs> they really believe in the possibility of ai for the future of um a virtual existence but well peggy and i maybe we have a kind of different hopes for ai right but <laughs> you want to talk about this a little you're referring to the criteria or well no but about that we don't that we believe that AI will always be a tool that we control no matter how good it is yeah exactly I mean you already said it so for us I think it's important that people understand AI as in human-made tools uh, which we uh, structure and not seeing this kind of technology as an as an autonomous application or even entity um, but I, what I also think is really is, uh, interesting, also especially in the um, in the art world, is the uh, the relationship between humankind and this technology in a form. And we also showed that um, as part of a online screening, uh, Mirror Mirror, as part of the online screening series, uh, Pass Pro Toto, in which we showed or presented uh, video artworks um, of artists interacting with uh, artificial intelligence. And this AI kind of like dealt with the private data of um, of the artist and thereby kind of like creating a mirror image uh, of the artist itself. And this is actually really interesting. So on the one hand, what is RT inf RT artificial intelligence doing with data and what is it creating out of it and what kind of image comes out of it? And what we see is often that it actually mirrors our society and our understanding, our, our, our thinking and our interaction with the world we live in. And I think this is also a very important topic when it comes to the future of AI. That's an interesting thought. Um, I just wanted to remind um, everyone to please share questions uh, via chat if you have any. Uh, I guess we didn't say that this time, but if you have any questions, please write them down in the chat. Um, I was wondering, um, Marcel and Björn, to what extent um, would you think um, would allow artificial intelligence um, virtual spaces to take on a life, an agency on their own, and what are the possibilities and risks of creating virtual spaces that have their own kind of life? Yeah, so basically, I think um, we haven't seen anything yet, right? So we are very, very early in this whole development. And um, and but but the the trend that we see is of course that um, larger networks, large larger amount of data, quicker uh, connections, stuff like that, that this exponentially changes um, the the performance of these um, artificial intelligence tools, um, and. Um, and th what that means maybe is that it doesn't matter anymore after a certain time if it is still a tool or what is the structure because it, in a way it will take on a life by itself. Um, <clears throat> we can, <clears throat> I'm sorry, we can always say, yeah, but, but in the end, uh, you know, humans will shape it and so on and so on. So possibly, yes, at, at the moment, I think the largest or the highest, uh, the biggest problem is, um, is um, corporations or rich individuals who, who use these tools um, and so become even more powerful than, than they've been before uh, with, uh, with a lower, um, lower amount of, of responsibility or of, um, um, of control mechanisms, checks and balances and so on. But in the end, if these networks and these algorithms uh, somehow get more um, capable, the performance is rising. Uh, so where's the difference, in a way, if this if this um, whole thing, if this um, piece of technology 
um, has its own life or if it's just ultra powerful and we don't know how it is, you know, um, um, how it is guided or who is behind the curtain in a way. What we've seen here is, um, or maybe this uh, Prometheus also is in a way is a play about, about human perception and about our urge in a way to be, um, to be tricked. Right, so a, a lot of this, what what's happening in the in the in the field of artificial intelligence, especially in the field of art, is just you know make believe in a way, and people want to believe. They want this ultra powerful algorithm or this creator or this artificial artist to exist. Maybe it does, maybe it doesn't. Um, um, and this is this is something that is very. Uh, this is something that I'm, uh, you know. Uh, um, um, concerned about um, our our tendency as humans to to find uh, some kind of supernatural thing that will tell us how stuff works, and us just listening and nodding our heads to some kind of profound wisdoms that have been uttered by whatever, you know. So basically, um, all that we've heard in the in the in the short piece that we shown, and I guess also um, in the beginning of this whole conversation, yeah. I don't know if this is ultra bullshit or if this is actually a profound um, profound thought. Uh, who cares? It's just you know it's presented in a way that it is. Um, um, it has authority. And so, okay, so I didn't answer the question if this whole thing will get agency. The, the thing is that sometimes we cannot we cannot distinguish between it. So if you play an um, 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 up-to-date um, computer game uh, with, you know, very scripted story elements and some kinds of artificial intelligence agents that, that drive the, the narrative or the game along, um, you don't know. If it is, you know, if it is real or not. Indeed, and, and this kind of brings me to a question that I'd like to pose to all of you, and that whether we need for these situations where AI is kind of in the mix, but it's not clear exactly what the role is, is there a kind of ethics of transparency in the use of AI that we should actually demand of ourselves and of others in the art world to some extent? And also thinking about the viewer should the public have the you know, opportunity to know what percent or which functions are taken by AI? Um, maybe T Tina and Peggy, you wanna start with this question? Well, yeah, I would love to because it really circles back to the idea of AI as a tool and very much to that what uh, Björn said. So uh, when artists work with AI and, and use text-based um, AIs to generate their like the text for their work, you know, you can tell us through people that it's AI generated or you don't tell. It's the same when you tell false facts and you know, you don't tell that people that these are actually not true facts. So you that's the thing, you never know what, what is behind the things you're perceiving. And um, therefore, also for us, it was important to say it's AI is a tool because it actually means that we don't believe that, or I mean, we don't, of course, we understand that AI is, um, is a creative tool or thing, thing or entity, but accepting that it's a human made tool, we also say that we can maybe not control it, but we can kind of steer it, we can choose with which images we feed the algorithm to create somewhat images. For example, there is this AI generated portrait of Edmond de Balami. It's from a French artist collective. Um, how are they called? Um, artist collective, obvious, right? So, and they fed an algorithm with 15,000 images of um, portraits from the Renaissance until today. And the outcome is like a white male as a portrait. So the question is more, you know, with kind of with what information we want to feed the algorithm, which kind of outcome or like own world of the AI we want to um, generate. I think that's uh, important. Yeah, I would agree to that. And I think, I mean, this is also kind of like the task of art to make um, questionable boundaries, um, developments and, and also characteristic of technology accessible and, and visible. 
But generally speaking, uh, when it comes to ethic and AI, I think it should be especially in, uh, relevant for, for companies, for industry or research centers um, actually creating or developing um, these applications. Um, I mean, thinking of AI that is, for instance, not able to recognize all skin colors, thereby creating uh, racist structures, or I mean, we also heard about these language patterns that were rarely um, able to, to recognize female voices, um, but very good, in a very good manner, uh, male voices, because of course, the persons who trained these applications were male, they were, the, the AI itself was more confronted with a, uh, yeah, male voice and I think seeing those kind of problems can be actually become very dangerous for our future in a way that they also reproduce and also strengthen um, patterns that are everything but inclusive. So I think this question of ethic actually also implies the question of uh, how we imagine or how we want our future to be like and how it should be structured. And yeah, I mean, having a, a diverse and equal image in mind, um, or that would be my ideal of society for our future. And this also means that this form or this shape, which is mirrored in AI, um, has also been mirrored um, in the departments taking care of these technologies, which means uh, it should not, as it is right now, um, Western wild male dominated, there should be all kind of um, by, like the group of BIPOCs, uh, people of color, indigenous people, um, people with all different um, cultural backgrounds. And I think this is important. And this is something that has to make conscious. And that's why art is so important as well, um, to actually make this conscious. Um, this technology is doing what we teach her to do. And she's dealing with these um, values we teach her to, to deal with. And yeah, I think that's important. And I mean, regarding these developments, of course, there is an ethical um, approach very important. Um, Marcel and Bjorn, do you want to add something to the question? Because it was uh, like a round yeah, question sure. on no, ethics. No problem. Um, the, the thing, um, when, when talking about um, giving us kind of the ingredients of a piece of art is uh, manifold. It's not simple to answer because when I use the metaphor of an artist who's using a certain brush and certain colors and, and a certain palette, and I would write this down below the image, then um, that might say some to some people, might not say anything to other people. And the same goes for if we have a label made with AI then already I would say what kind of AI, and what data set and so on and so forth. All of these things might not be to the layman and the observer say anything about this. And also um, let's say that the, there's still the curatorial side of like the process. How would you describe that? How, would, how has this been weighted? How much machine is here? How much human intervention is here? So um, that's actually the thing I think with artificial intelligence. While we on the surface have kind of an vague idea of some kind of cyber overlord system that can create many things. On the other hand, uh, the stuff is quite complex to understand, even for the artists themselves. It's hard. They tinker with networks that they don't understand, that even the creators don't understand. And so, um, yeah, I, I think I like the idea of having some like this has been made with GMO when I'm going to the supermarket. But also this, uh, this also doesn't show me the level of complexity that has been done when genes are modified to create a rich flavor in my tomatoes and so on and so forth. And this is, this is kind of a asymmetrical thing that is happening right now. Why we live in this kind of awesome future, but a lot of these tools, these tools also shape us. And they also show us that our systems and our rules and our regulations seem to be quite outdated because when I'm making a theater piece that is driven by a machine algorithm that is creating texts and giving kind of like a, instructions to my artists and uh, the dancers or whatever, who's the author here? What does copyright mean anymore? Um, how does, does this need to be labeled? I could always go to the courts and ask them, but they would say, we don't know. 
like my um, insurer one time asked me what's my job description because he has a directory of job descriptions and I don't have a job description that has been created yet. So I see there's, we are advancing very fast. And I think some of the technologies that we're using, they are even, there's this joke, when you buy a computer, it's outdated once you come home. The same is with neural networks. Whenever we stand up in the morning, we check our feeds and find out there's been plenty of people been working through the night to advance certain things and new things come out and it's a it's a weird rat race and i sometimes wonder if there's any chance to catch up with regulations and and uh, and you need authority and also understanding and um it's it's hard to because the people who understand the most work on these things and they can't really be bothered sometimes about the ethics because they're really into it they really like what they're doing and they have their prerogative coming maybe from the guys upstairs who do the management um, and coming from the money side because stuff needs to be viable to exist in a marketplace. So most products that we see are actually um, trying to replace certain things to copywriting, marketing, and so on and so forth. But I see new companies popping up uh, every day and I don't see um, people or authorities looking at this thing and thinking about all of these questions that we're posing here. This is, this is maybe why we have, of course, to be somehow a little bit proactive here. So um, with, the, with this example of that play, um, Prometheus, uh, so what we did there on the, on the, uh, in the program book or whatever, we actually listed um, a couple of um, scientific papers um, that were <laughs> basically responsible for the machine learning algorithms that we used. So uh, this is something that you normally don't see so often when you when you get a um, an information sheet of of the piece that you just saw in theater. Um, the so to say the technological um, um, foundation of that, because we want to be open about this as much as we can. Because what Marcel just said, if you just label it done by an AI. An AI it's actually maybe even uh, making it more mysterious and clearing it not up, but but uh, muddying the waters. Thank you so much. Um, that was uh, the ethics. Um, as we have been talking a lot about co-creation in this whole just like last two days, um, I was just wondering if you could maybe give us some answers to the question of in which way artificial intelligence could be used to involve um, the public, the audience into the creative process, into co-creation. Is, um, is there just like, um, yeah, something interesting which could be uh, just like involving the audience much more than today? Um, we have been thinking about this in a couple of our last productions, um, and and we are not still well. Still, we are not very clear or very sure how to proceed here. Um, <clears throat> I guess as an artist, you have the uh, the basic idea, of course, to to show something um, that you've done uh, or that you've created. And um, and once you involve somebody else, someone else, some something else, um, it gets out of your hands in a way, and you must want this. And uh, and in the end, I guess you have an idea about what you want to achieve and um, want to well not let go too much of of the whole process in a way so the question so for example in this play um what we do is we start with a with a randomly you know um, phrase out of the audience so we ask people to to give us a starting phrase in a way to 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 send of the machine um, and in a way to show that this is actually is live right so and that this working now in this moment and that this were, were no pre prepared things um, but then we stopped it so there's no further interaction with the audience because in a way of course there is already a lot of interaction with the audience because the actors roam free in the, in the audience so they sit beside beside members of the audience for example and whisper in their ear and stuff like this but they don't have any more influence on that and um, but 
I think Marcel has a, has a different um, a view of that because I always um, worry about, in a way, the quality or the level or, or something of what and we want to achieve. I don't, I don't anymore because um, I have to be honest with you guys, I had kind of an epiphany because I was also working with another neural network that would create artificial human beings, photographs of artificial human beings. There's one uh, famous video, One Million Faces from Unreal Places that are all of these synthetic human beings that look very much like your neighbor or somebody else you would see on um, platforms. And um, while I was running through the system, I actually kind of began to think that I am in there somewhere that um, me, as I'm thinking, I'm a very original human being. I have my facial structures and my body and things like that. And there's this mathematical algorithm that infinitely creates new human beings um, by all of the structures that it has analyzed. And also the same with um, these infinite amounts of text that I created together with Björn before we did, uh, because we tested the system and tried to find out how we can nudge it in certain directions. It's a little bit like having a very small flashlight and that flashlight has a very narrow um, light uh, keck that is coming up in front of it. And you have this huge dark structure and you only have this little piece of light. And in the end, you find that all of these texts that are created forevermore, they don't stop. Um, they, they don't care so you don't care so much about quality anymore because people can care about quality when they're in the moment when they have something that has a beginning and an end but if you are in this vast network of images of human beings of texts you lose this sense and that's that's one thing one quality that is a, a hyper object so to say we don't know what it is really as human beings but we have to try to understand it because it's a uh, a, pro, pro, um, a property of the network. And, and that's some, some of the things uh, in artificial intelligence research challenge the way we think about reality. We think about processes. And as an artist, this is amazing because it's something entirely new. And if we are able to bring this down on a stage or in a museum or in a gallery, then we can actually start the participation with information. We can give people these perspectives into these technologies so they, that they on their own begin to ask questions. And I think this is the, the first step. I, um, I'm on board with Björn um, saying um, interaction is, is something that is complicated, but I also believe that um, being honest and showing these things to people through the eye of an artist would really help us all get back into uh, a democratic discourse about these things because I don't think it's happening because it's, it's a little bit like I can read and I can write, but other people's can't. I can still stand in front of them and preach about technology, but as long as people don't understand the basics of the stuff and how it works and operates, they are at a loss. And I am the guy with, uh, sometimes I even call it superpowers because these technologies give me certain abilities that other people might not have. And that is absolutely not fair to say the least. Well, it seems like we have a very interesting conclusion then to, to this discussion, which I will unfortunately have to wrap up now, but it's been clear that, you know, to bring the public in, we need more transparency around AI and we need to start thinking about these somewhat difficult ways to involve them. And it really makes me think of the, the beautiful way that Latobo expressed it at the start of this with the really, this is a very fraught attitude towards AI. And I think that this we need to keep this attitude with us as well. So thank you, Tina and Peggy and Loturbo. Thank you, Bjorn and Marcel. Um, I actually will also say goodbye now. This is the last format I'll be moderating today. And I will hand over to Katja, who will take care of you for the rest of the program. Thank you, bye. Thank you so much. Thank you, Joanna. That was great. And thank you to all of you um, for your participation and your interesting thoughts. Um, and uh, we will all see each other again at uh, four o'clock for the last digital sofa of this digital lab uh, with the name co-creation im fond di digital. This will be in German, um, but I will explain later, but you will find a translation if you need it by clicking on the English translation button. Okay, so thank you very much, all of you, and um, we see each other, the rest, in a few minutes already. Thank you. Thank you, guys.